an astounding uh, revealing of research. It's Nassem's research. We're going to actually start out talking about it here. Uh, and Nassem, do you want to, you know, I call it, you know, myself, I'm not a scientist, but as I uh, have worked with Nassem and Greg Braden, my, the way I look at this is Einstein, you may know, went to his grave working on a unified field theory, and he couldn't quite get there. Well, guess what? Uh, Nassem and his team have, are, are taking us there with all of the astounding implications of this and some. Uh, so, Nassem, am I, is that a decent general yeah, framing I, here? Do you want to talk a little about your research? <laughs> Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, you know, I've written multiple papers in the last 35 years of research, um, and they all built on each other in certain ways. In 2012, I wrote a paper, I think, that was uh, pivotal, uh, that uh, finally kind of like rounded up and explicitly and formally describe the information flow that produces the material world, the forces and so on. And uh, although it was really kind of tentative, um, it was and, and, and uh, not explored in, this, in its depth, it was right away able to produce very, very interesting results, like uh, amazing, you know, predictions, uh, and uh, one of them being the radius of the proton, which is really, really an important value in physics because it's the nuclear of atoms. It's and it it's the part that has most the mass, and it's it's the part that is really like at the heart of the matter, if I may say. Uh, and uh, it predicted a radius that was a it gave the correct mass, the correct forces, the correct uh, velocities, and all this. But when I was using the equation, which I called the holographic mass solution, it generated a radius that was a little strange. It was 4% smaller than the standard model radius. Um, and, uh, you know, and the measurements of, of the time. So it was uh, startling because 4% might not sound like a lot, but it is um and um you know in quantum theory values that are fundamental like constants and the radius the electron you know the um you know things like that uh, mass of the electron and so on are known to very high level of accuracy in some cases uh to 10 to the minus uh, 13 uh, level of accuracy that is 13 numbers after the period are known and so to be four percent off was like being in another universe um although considering that the that the theory and the and the equations were able to predict masses of black holes and cosmological events like and so on like the radius of the universe and so on i was pretty confident that it was correct uh, I was just thinking maybe it's not as accurate when I get down to the quantum level, uh, but because it was giving very accurate values for quantum forces as well, um, I assumed that it was actually completely uh, accurate. And uh, I made a prediction in that paper that it would uh, probably come out when we measured the radius the proton uh, more precisely. And uh, unbeknown to me, I published in 2012, in December of 2012, unbeknown to me, there was a team in Switzerland that was just about to, that had been working on measuring the radius the proton more precisely. To make a long story short, they measured the value I predicted. I was within one sigma, that is, I was within the margin of error of their experiment. These are the kind of thing that confirms theories in history. And then, you know, eventually that was repeated many, many times. And in 2018, the codata value, that is the value, the standard value for all constants in physics was changed for the radius, the proton. And the error that was done earlier is that the, uh, the 
quantum standard model uh, adjustment they were doing with the standard model uh, values w needed to be removed to actually get the correct value. And so really supporting the research. And so I'm telling you this because what I'm excited about right now is that I was able to like, with the help of uh, Dr. Olivier Allerol, which is a physicist in France, uh, well, that works with us uh, here in the US, and I was able to extend this um, formalism to all forces, all scales, and all constants in physics, like so that it predicts not just one constant, which is would be already remarkable, but it predicts all constants in physics and show the relationship with the constants and the scales and the forces in a comprehensive understanding of our universe. And, and, and that's just amazing. It's, it's mind blowing. It, it makes me sing every day. Yeah, it is mind blowing. Let me um, also, I'm going to just share that in the way I understand this. Tell me if I'm off on any of this, Nassim. Again, I'm not a scientist, but so uh, this, this uh, research that Nassim's team is doing, it addresses everything from quantum scale, so, so the smallest objects, to cosmological objects. So I'm going to just stop on each of these points. On this, current physics is just there's one set of science for larger objects, and there's another set of science for smaller objects, and there's not an intersection. Now, Sim's research addresses it all, from the smallest to the largest objects. Then, yeah, as he's sorry, mentioning... Steve. Yeah. Yeah. I launched into this whole thing, and I forgot about the basics. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, that's good. Yes. And then, and then the, uh, he's bringing in cosmic constants. So, these cosmic constants account for everything out in the universe. Uh, there's nothing that's left out. What's, what's more, current physics is, is addressing the material world. Now, now Sim's research is addressing the material and the non-material or physical and non-physical worlds. So uh, sentient beings are, are in this. Uh, it's accounting right. for the evolution of the universe. Uh, the, in fact, the, in my understanding, now Sim's research says the universe is alive, it's conscience, conscious, it's intelligence, it's intelligent, and this field, which is the universe, is in you. So, I mean, on, on, on any one of these things I'm addressing, we could like stop and talk about the stunning and astounding implications when you put all, try and put all of this together. Uh, it's it's yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, this is like we're, we've got a few thousand equations in a 200 pages paper right now that will be reduced to, you know, something we can publish at Nature or whatever, but like what I'm, um, I'm like, so, but, but although there's all this complexity and although what you just described seems unrelated, right? Um, actually it just shows that there's one thing. There's only one thing in the universe, uh, meaning that matter and consciousness are not separated. There is, you know, matter and like uh, biology and physics, right? Matter, like what we call inert matter uh, and biology are not um, uh, separated, that one leads to the other. And basically this one thing that makes up everything is a flow of information, a flow, a field of energy. So in physics, information and uh, energy have an equivalence or, you know, entropy. And, and, and there is, um, and I've identified what I've called a Planck plasma, basically a, a fluid dynamic, um, you could think of it as a gas, but it's not really a gas. It, it has different phases. Um, and so it can be a super fluid, it can be a super solid, it can be a super fluid and then it can be a gas so it can go through phase transitions and um you know, and and this uh this this field um is at the source so you could think of it as like the little fluctuations of e 
fluctuation of this field as like a, a field of information. And this field of information is flowing through all the scales. And it's the source of all of these scales. So, so the field of information is can be chaotic in region, but where that field spins into little vortices, because there's a gradient there, then they make particles or they make a star or they make a galaxy or they make a universe or they make a multiverse and so on. And, um, and as the flow of this information goes through these different scale, they make forces, they produce forces. And these are the forces that we see as the strong force, the weak force, the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force. And so, I, you know, all this, I want to make sure your viewer understand, I'm talking formally, meaning this is now in this paper, formally explicited uh, and clearly explicited so that we understand. And of course, you know, there's a, there's a sub Planckian field that feeds the Planckian field and the sub sub Planckian field that feeds that. So it's a fractal nature of information in space. And the crazy part is that eventually, uh, the amazing part is that eventually uh, this information flow produce coherent behavior at all the scales that eventually create coherent behaviors that make cells and these cells produce coherent behaviors of information transfer, right? The cells have to communicate and all this that eventually makes a body and the and biology and, and this biological dynamics uh, eventually have enough information flow through them, information feedback flow through them that they become self-aware and now you have consciousness. Uh, I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the, the implications we're going to, we're going to get to, uh, the implications of this. I, I, I'll just share again, though, it's astounding. It, it, this research, you could say it turns the world upside down. I'd say it turns the world right side up, uh, because, the, what we've been about in humanities team for 18 years, we're a global nonprofit organization, is, is this whole ancient truth this, uh, that, that we are all one, right? And now, now as, as Nassim was just sharing, that's actually when we come to the center of what this means, it's, it's that we are actually all one. So science now, we now are standing on a platform, we could call it a solid foundation, we could call it cement, a cement platform, where, where science is saying this is true. What the mystics have shared over millennia, this ancient truth, uh, this timeless truth that we're all one, science is saying this is true. So now, and the, and the implications Correct. for us individually are astounding. We're gonna get to some here in just a moment. We're gonna go to some clips. Before we do, I wanna share though, uh, so Greg Braden and Nassim Harriman and Humanities team, we created a program called Secret Scientific Discoveries. Uh, if you go to secretscientificdiscoveries.com, uh, you can register for the program. There's a free series. Uh, we, we just unveiled Greg's last night and uh, Nassim's is next Tuesday. When you go to secretscientificdiscoveries.com and register, leave your name and email address, you'll be able to immediately watch Greg's program and you'll then see you'll be invited to the program Tuesday night when we unveil for the very first time Nassim's program. So let's go uh, to, some, to the first video clip here, Jim, and uh, then Nassim and I are gonna come back and talk about it. In this program where we've talked about Greg Braden, mm -hmm. he shared that there are many potential applications for the new physics and biology including in energy, space travel, mm -hmm. medical, computers, healing of trauma, and, and so much more. Can, can you help us uh, vision some of this or uh, understand what examples of this might be? Oh, yeah. I mean, the implications of understanding uh, the fundamental physics of this fundamental field um, have... Uh, you know, very large implications in many fields, like from even temporal 
violation as we were talking about, like meaning being able to predict things in times or and so on, which are not precluded precluded from Einstein field equation neither, so people understand. But as well, you know, energy production and gravity control and health and implications are remarkable, tremendous. Uh, we're talking about uh, almost infinite amount of energy available in every point. Uh, or we're talking about uh, being able to control gravitational fields just as we've built a whole civilization um, in the industrial era based on controlling electromagnetic field, which we succeeded in doing very well and, you know, produced the civilization we have today where we're transferring data over electromagnetic waves and we're using electricity and all this stuff. Well, now the next step for humanity is to control the gravitational field. This could not be possible because we didn't have a fundamental analytical solution to the gravitational constant, meaning we didn't understand gravity at its most fundamental level. Einstein told us that it was the curvature of space-time, but he didn't tell us what space-time was made of. And so now we're discovering that actually space-time is a fluctuation of the of the quantum field, like a plasma. It's like it's a structure, and that that structure, yes, when it curves, it produces gravity, which is what Einstein found. But that is a real structure, it does produce real effect, we call it gravity, so it's not just a conceptual thing. Now we are actually understanding the mechanics of this, and it's giving the right solution for the mass and for the electromagnetic field and for charge and all this. So all of a sudden we understand where these things come from, forces, and now we can even imagine that using this technology we could extract matter directly from space, that is, the replicator, you know, uh, it becomes possible. We're talking about uh, opening the mouth of wormholes. We're talking about warp drive. We're talking about, you know, very, very advanced technology can emerge from this. And I assure you that this is not, um, you know, so fringe, meaning like there is a section at NASA, uh, Sonny White works in it, Dr. Sonny White works in it, and, you know, they've been trying to make a warp uh, drive for m multiple decades uh, using vacuum, uh, quantum vacuum fluctuations. So this is not so far out, it's just that um, now I've been able to solve the equations in the standard model of physics um, with no free parameters, all from first principle, describing you know these scales and these constants and, and and that gives us the roadmap for the development of those technologies all right so that's a little uh it's a small section from this program that uh now sam and i do that we're broadcasting on tuesday night beginning at 5 p.m pacific uh, that's 8 eastern and again uh, secretscientificdiscoveries.com and you can register for that program now sam the uh the applications for this uh, research are are just, you know, where do, where does it start and where does it end? I mean, I know where it's, you know, there's a lot of things we can share here, uh, and I'm not even sure we could get to where it ends. It's just there, there's there's so much here, isn't there? Right. I mean, it's hard to um, it's hard to visualize or even predict uh, predict the uh, all of the implications of. Uh, of this and and like you said it's a foundation that we will build on uh and it's funny you use that terminology of cement because uh that's exactly what olivier and i when we were looking at the equations a few days ago and we were seeing that like now that we have this unification of physics all the constants are in relationship like constants that didn't have a relationship before uh, you know, like uh, the gravitational constant and the Rydberg constant and, you know, the, the uh, you know, alpha and uh, mu and all these constants of, of physics. And we were like looking at all the links between them and it was, it was so strong, so amazing, so beautiful. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, it, when we drew the equations that made the links, when we drew the relationships, um, it started to make um, geometry that resembled ancient symbols. But 
um, what um, what was amazing is that it was like that's that was exactly my statement. It's like cement; you can't move it anymore. It's so um, it's so self consistent, meaning like every point, you know, is like um, uh, very highly precise. So any changes you do would tweak everything and everything would start falling apart. It has to be all exactly what it is in order for everything to come together. So, you know, with this level of, you know, consistency and, um, and, and interaction that, that, that it's correct, but as well, it's just like, such a strong foundation. It's so well cemented um, together and uh, and it's beautiful, meaning like it's beautiful both in the mathematical concept of beauty, which you know is a con is a concept that is in science, but it's beautiful most importantly in the concept of um uh, you know, in, in, in its, in its, um, it's like a, it, it's like a flower that opens and you get this amazing beauty, uh, emerging that leads you like all kinds of ways to, for instance, understanding empirical values that we have, like Ohm's law and other things, um, that we don't necessarily know where they come from right? We just empirically measure them. And then all of a sudden those things get pulled in and conservation laws get pulled in and pulled in. So now you understand why conservation is occurring in, in, in the universe, but as well, um, you know, it, it, the beauty as well is that it has this, um, this kind of like aura of, um, of impossible um it, it, so 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 that like you can visualize the universe and the world around you as literally a fluid structure that is continuously flowing because we have a tendency to think that atoms you know are like these little billiard balls that are like just kind of like these little particles um, but actually when, when you look closely, you realize atoms are absolutely not like billiard balls. Protons are absolutely, all we know is that in that region of space, there's a charge that repels other charge, an electrostatic charge. And, and that, you know, that region of space is segregated, but basically what you discover is that it's all like a fluid and out of these equations, there are completely unrelated to uh, to uh, fluid dynamics equation, out comes the Novi-Stokes equations, which are the fluid dynamics equation and so on. And so this whole thing, all of a sudden you, you start to feel the flow of creation. And, and not only like, not only you start to feel it, but now you have the details of it, like for instance, the dynamics of this flow, like the toroidal dynamics of this flow. And because the, the equation are, are giving you the details, meaning you're, you're solving the equation. And if you don't solve them with the correct flow, you don't get the right answer. So you have to find the flow, how it's flowing. And so it's telling you exactly how the universe flow. And that's, it just kind of blows your mind. So now Sem and his research team uh, share, uh, I, I know all this because I, I, we, uh, Greg Braden and myself and, and our team were down in uh, Nassim's lab there in San Clemente for, for a while uh, and uh, got to sit down with him and his team to really deeply understand this. It's, again, it's astounding, uh, but, um, uh, so one, one of the ways it can be framed is, in fact, that Nassim's team frames it as a user's guide or a map to the whole universe. You know, in, you know since we're uh, like unlocking the secrets to the whole universe as we consider 
our own lives and how we live collectively on the planet and for that matter how the cosmos lives it's it's that big uh last night one of the things greg braden and i were discussing relating to this is that of course we live right now in this time where there's so much uncertainty right of uh, with covid and polarity and politics and 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 it's like what is the truth you know in anything because it, it breaks out splinters right and it splinters left and it's hard to discern what is the truth well so this cement platform thing so how cool is this we're now can stand on this cement platform that is looking straight at ultimate reality and describing what it is how it works and and it's saying that all of what this universe is lives at what we could call it the field that it lives in you so uh, now things there like clairvoyance claircognizance <laughs> yeah, yeah go ahead and say uh, yeah, because you're made of atoms, and these atoms are made out of that field. Um, so, like, it's literally, it's not a metaphor to say that it lives in you. You know, it's literally, <laughs> you are made out of <laughs> that stuff, every atom you're made of. And it's flowing. It, you know, we have a tendency to see ourselves as this static being, because we... Uh, our perception at our scale is so vastly uh, deceiving compared to what's happening at the smaller scale. So, for instance, your body is made of about 50 to 100 trillion atoms, uh, cells. I mean, and that's a lot of cells. You know, I mean, already cells are small. And the fact that they all know what to do is remarkable. Like that they... <laughs> You know, that your heart cells don't start making liver cells and your liver cells don't start making heart cells like, you know, which would produce a really bad day for you if it if that happened. Because they're dividing at a million cells a second, right? And uh, each cell is made of about 100 trillion atoms. So it's 100 trillion multiplied by 100 trillion that you're made of, 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 of of stuff so it's it's non-trivial you know it's like it's like galaxies right it's it's non-trivial amount of of dynamic and and um and and these things are way 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 smaller because a hundred trillion atoms in a cell is small right the proton is even much smaller and then you know the Planck scale is like billions and trillions of times smaller so that if I took a proton and I grew it so it was a grain of sand, then the uh, if I took a Planck and I grew it so it was a grain of sand, then the proton would have a diameter of about 40 trillion kilometers, like the distance between the sun and Alpha Centauri. So, you know, um, and, 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 and this dynamic is happening inside you like constantly and you're not static you're 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 throwing stuff out like constantly you're burning at about 100 uh, fahrenheit you know close to 100 fahrenheit and if this system gets confused if it did and all of a sudden your temperature went up a few degrees or went down a few degrees you're having a really really bad day so it's, it's in a state of very high dynamical equilibrium and it's maintaining, it's like your blood pH as well. You know, your blood pH, uh, if it changes by 0.1, you're not feeling so great. If it's changed by 0.2, you're extremely ill. If it changes by 0.3, you're, you're, you're done, right? You, you, your cells are decohering. The 100 trillion multiplied by the 100 trillion atoms that you're made of are out of there, right? So, you know, it's an amazing thing. And uh, it, 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 and so you're the flow. You, you're literally redoing yourself. It's just it's redoing itself at a much lower rate than the rest you know, like the, the plant field, but you're redoing yourself. So, so there's entropy, right, across the scale. And at our scale, the redoing 
is occurring at about the rate of a million cells every second. And, 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 and so you're constantly changing. You're constantly this flow of information that's transforming you. And you're constantly gathering information right through your senses. So you can think of it as the universe learning about itself through you. Yeah. So let me, and then in my layman's terms, as I, as I take all this in, so uh, what I get from this is we talk about just the personal implications. So first, you know, Nassim brought in oneness. So the connection of the universe that we, we are deeply, we think of our family, you know, it's me and well, well, who's your family? It's me and my wife and my two kids. Well, guess what? I mean, we can, we can think of it that way if we want, but I mean, what this research is saying, no, you are deeply, deeply connected to every person, the planet, all life, not only on this planet, but the whole of the cosmos. So and that's just connection. Then we go to wisdom. Well, you know, I brought in clairvoyance. So this, what the, uh, Larry Doss, Dr. Larry Doss uses this term, non-local wisdom. Well, Nassim is, is saying, yeah, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're one. So we can access, you know, non-local wisdom of the, from the whole cosmos. And then I'll even bring in the power dimension uh, of, well, the power of the universe. If the field lives in you, connection and wisdom, well, guess what? The power of the universe does too, especially where, where it's very pure, where we're acting on behalf of the whole, where the cell is a white blood cell supporting the body, or it's an organ that's supporting the body, and where the where the universe uh, feels into that. And I, I'm not sure, you know, Nassim can comment on this, but this this is my own uh, interpretation that where I'm where I'm acting on behalf of the whole, the whole is 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 lending me its power. That that's how it feels to me. Uh, now, other implications though: uh, self healing, abundant energy new economy, abundant agriculture, making wars obsolete. So, you know, when we were saying, where, what are the implications that we're saying, oh my God, you know, we can talk about where it starts, but I, I don't, we, we can't even get to where it ends because the implications are just mind blowing here. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, you know, you were talking about nonlinear uh, access to information, right? Uh, meaning that, you, you have access to more than just the information that's around you that you can reach or touch or see. Or, and um, and uh, clearly these mathematics show that all particles are entangled at the Planck scale and that the entanglement is, um, you know, we measure it in the laboratory. Uh, it, it's not something that... Uh, theory in the um, in the 40s and 50s and 60s and so on kind of like elucidated from quantum theory but that was never measured this is something that's measured we know particles can be entangled in fact we've been able to now entangle much larger objects than particles like you can entangle diamonds in a laboratory so that you can wiggle this diamond over here with the laser and the diamond across the laboratory is vibrating as if it was being hit by the laser itself. And we've been able to transfer bits of information now from a satellite to the ground in a nonlinear fashion using entanglement, which is instantaneous. In fact, in these equations, we've shown actually that although it appears instantaneous to us, it's not quite instantaneous. It's just extremely fast. Um, we were able to uh, calculate the speed of the, what we call the refresh rate of the universe. So, the, so imagine all the particles are entangled and the information is flowing right through all of the scales of the universe um, because the universe has to know what it's doing. So it's, co it's able to cohere things, right? It's, it has to, communicate and and so um uh, if you, if that was happening at the speed of light we'd be in deep doo-doo it would be really bad you know because it's like uh it takes billions of years for light to go across the universe so it, the information would never get there 
and like the universe would be really slow at changing, right? It would be like, oh, everything would be like, whoa. But, but, uh, but entanglement is instantaneous in the standard model because they don't really have the mechanics for it. But, but as you write this unified field theory, all of a sudden entanglement becomes clear and it's really is just that the universe is in resonance and it's communicating at the sub Planckian level. And when you calculate that, the, the, it, it, your, the information is moving across the universe and I, I call it as well the the speed of thoughts, the speed of thoughts of the universe. Um, and it's happening at approximately 10 to the 40th times faster than the speed of light. So that, you know, the speed of light is about 10 to the 10, you know, so that you're going at 10 to the 50th, you know, and, 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 uh, and this thing. And, and so that the speed of light would look like a brick wall. It would look like it's it's not moving, right? To you, if you were going at the speed of thoughts, if you're going at the speed, the, the speed of light would be like really slow. And so while the speed of light would transfer a bit of information across the universe in billions of years, at the speed of the subplank, which is moving through the Planckian wormholes, um, the uh, speed of refresh across the universe is 10... Uh, to the minus 23 seconds, right? Which is a really interesting number. Uh, that's really, 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 really fast, right? Like you, there's no way we would think it's instantaneous, of course. But um, but but it's an interesting value as well because it's the value of rotation of a proton. But that's another thing. So um, the, this uh, this is uh, really. Uh, uh, powerful as well when these equations come out and you realize that you're actually calculating the, the speed at which the universe refresh or the speed at which the universe thinks or, or absorb information and then, and then play on it. So now, so now you start to get the feeling that like, as you're thinking and interpreting the world, the, the universe is feeding you back through the refresh rate, you know, your experiences, and then you interpret them again. And, if we, and now you get the feed forward feedback dynamics that we're all doing, but you gotta remember, you're not just doing it individually, you're doing it with the whole of everything, like all of humanity, all of the material world, everything is feeding back. Uh, in this incredible dynamics of creation that are just mind blowing, you know. So let me, yeah, let me. We're coming to you live. So I'm I'm in, here in Boulder, Colorado. Steve Farrell with Humanities Team. Now Sam Harriman's coming to you live from his uh, laboratory there in Southern California, San Clemente. Um, so there are lots of comments and questions here. Thank you, uh, viewers. Uh, Humanity Stream Plus members are here with us. We're going to even invite them to come on screen here in a minute. Uh, but let me share that, again, there's so much that we're covering. If you want to get a distillation of a lot of this, secretscientificdiscoveries.com, you'll get uh, the program we unveiled last night with Greg Braden. That broadcast will come to you right away. And then Nassim's broadcast is Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You'll be invited to come to that as well, where we break all of this down and get into the science, <clears throat> the implications, including the personal implications. Um, but by the way, as Nassim was going over this whole speed of light thing, um, one of the implications there, people would wonder, you know, extraterrestrials and UFOs are getting now even mainstream attention. And if the speed of light is as fast as we can go, well then, you know, it, uh, how does it work? Because the, these people would be dead right. 10 times over before they got to the planet. But now this research, here's another implication. Were, you, you heard Nassim just share about how, what uh, the, the, the speed of light is like a brick wall, right? It's not fast at all, but yeah, it, it, he's, he's bringing in the science that speaks to what the real possibility is, which now explains this whole extraterrestrial thing. So just one more right. implication here. Um, so now in, the, uh, in our Humanity Stream Plus room, by the way, Humanity Stream Plus is uh, we're uh, a nonprofit uh, in transformational education. We 
developed a streaming platform for those that are living consciously. So all of you viewers, of course, fall into this. This program is going on uh, Humanity Stream Plus. We've, we've got members that come in live to talk to our uh, faculty each week and during mentoring. Uh, Nassim will actually be doing mentoring as part of this program we're talking about. Uh, if you go to humanitiesteam.org forward slash stream, so that's humanitiesteam.org forward slash stream, you'll see this revolutionary platform with hundreds of programs there, master classes, uh, other transformational education, feature length movies. Uh, it's not only revolutionary in terms of its graphical intuitive interface that can be that's streamed to uh, Roku and uh, Amazon Prime uh, and Apple TV and Google Pay and all of these so you can get it on any device. It's also it's intuitive and graphical so my 87 year old mother can't get lost. And lastly it's economical. Uh, if you were to buy these programs individually it'd be something like $14,000, uh, where this is $497 a year, $497 a year for all of these hundreds of uh, programs. Uh, if you browse Nassim Harriman on this, you'll see the programs he's already done, and this new uh, masterclass with Greg Braden is going to this platform as well. So uh, do check out the hum Humanity Stream Plus platform. If you're on the conscious journey, uh, you want to know about it. Now, um, let me come to some of the comments from uh, Humanity Stream members that are here with us. So uh, Cheryl says, I'm kind of a physics science dummy. I never knew there were all these particles in the universe. How was that discovered? So now Sam Cheryl is just uh, kind of walking in. I'm sure you, when you talk to audiences, as you do all over the world, you get questions like this. Mm -hmm. What was the question? Uh, and she says, I, I never knew there were all these particles or and objects in the universe. Uh, how, you know, well, in, in your research, how did you kind of expand the research and discovery around all of this? Um, That's a big question, yes. because, which is why you have so many scientists and mathematics researchers there with you on site. But. Yeah, right. Well, you know, there is definitely evidence of um, particles. You know, we know of protons, electrons, we know of subatomic particles because we've built these huge colliders that uh, crashes protons together and get smaller particles. Um, we, got, we have a whole zoo of particles actually that have come out in the standard model. Um, you know, I, I could comment on that, but I'm gonna skip. Um, but there is a lot of evidence um, that these particles are actually emerging from this fundamental field, both in the standard model, meaning it's just not been interpreted appropriately in the standard model, but you know, they have a Higgs field and so on, which is kind of because the math has kind of like taking turns and not quite gelled together properly. But basically you can, um, and, and you can imagine that, um, so people might say, well, wait, what is he talking about? Like, you know, a field, does he mean like a field in the space? Um, and uh, that's exactly what I mean. And, and then people say, well, if it's so dense with particles, why can't I feel it? How do I, you know, what do you mean? And it, and, and it's uh, it's like uh, it's like this, you know. The the electromagnetic field is in the field all around you, meaning it's all around you right now. Uh, there's infrared, ultraviolet. There's background radiation from the galaxy. There's like background radiation from the universe. There's all kinds of stuff. There's radio waves with the football <laughs> game and you know, the the music and all this that you can tune in. If you have a little crystal in a little box, then you can hear the music come out. Well, that's all in the field around you. And you don't know it's there unless you measure it. Uh, well, this is a field that is like, you know, massively at, at scales, massively smaller than anything you can experience directly uh, at frequencies that are way higher than even like the electromagnetic field that we understand or 
that we know of. So basically, you know, it's translucent to us. It's transparent to us. We don't know it's there. And that's why it's taken so long to discover it. Although it was predicted yeah. almost a hundred years ago by quantum uh, field theory and, you know, um, you know, by other, um, by, by Einstein in some ways with relativity, where he described gravity as a result of space curving, but didn't say what space was made of, right? So it's it kind of like missed the point in some ways, although it was a really important discovery to realize that gravity wasn't like a force that was coming from the object. But what this is push this is pushing the boundary even further and saying actually the space and the stuff that's not the space that we call matter is still the space <laughs> because, right. because it's made out of that field that makes up the space. So when it's in the space, it's more incoherent, right? I, we could call it a Fermi phase for people that are more technical. And when it's in mat, when it's matter, it's like a Bose phase where it's coherent because it's spinning in that region. So all the little particles are all lined up and they're all moving together, you know, coherently. And then you think there's something like, but it's still the space, <laughs> it's still the field, so it's one thing. Yeah, yeah, boy, thank you, Nassim. There's, there's a lot here. In fact, Drew asked the question, he says, how can those of us who want to know more and fully understand the repercussions of this information? So a couple things, Drew, one, uh, the secret scientific discoveries .com. This is this brand new program here uh, that uh, Nassim Harriman, Greg Braden, and Humanities team have created to sign up, and you'll get these two 60-minute broadcasts as well. Uh, Nassim's organization, uh, Nassim uh, Resonance uh, uh, .com. What what uh, what website can they go to to really fully understand your science? Right. Yeah, people can go and take a, a free course on our uh, platform as well uh, called uh, the Resonance Science Foundation, so resonancescience.org. Uh, and they can register for a free course and you will see, you know, um, uh, seven modules that describe all this um, and that goes through in a layman's term. And there's an eight module that's about to be launched in the next few months when we publish the paper that will explain that part. Uh, that's a lot of studying. That's a lot of reading. That's a lot of references and all this. So, you know, I suggest at least to do both and to get, you know, the, the understanding in, in, the, in the course on the humanities team and then register on our platform uh, you know, for sure. And like that as well, you'll stay updated to what is being published and when it's being published. And then if people can become members of our nonprofit foundation on that platform of the Resident Science Foundation, that helps us tremendously in continuing the research efforts and being able to move forward and give people the information they need. It's, it's really critical for us at this time. Yeah, so check, check this out, viewers. Uh, Nassim is doing such great work and it's so important. Uh, really, you know, we're, we're getting to ultimate reality here and, and this whole ultimate reality where we thought everything was separate and the field is up in the cloud somewhere. You know, truly, there's just a completely new ultimate reality that we're opening to from this research. So check out uh, these sites that Nassim was just sharing about. Now, Victor brings in, he says, What's the rest of the planet going to think about these discoveries? Won't forbidden science dissolve as forbidden science? And it's funny, Victor, you bring that in. One of the things we do share in the program, we're gonna to go to a clip here in just a second. We don't have that much more time, uh, but we're gonna to go to a clip from uh, Nassim's program. But uh, one of the things we do share in the program is that there are many institutions that uh, would be taken apart, that are taken apart by this science. Uh, we, you know, it, it is, it's power, it's money, it's ego, these things that maintain these uh, old structures. And uh, that's why it's, uh, that's why the science is forbidden in the classroom. In fact, uh, for people that wanna go deeper into all of this, we've, you'll, you'll see we've created a new masterclass called Forbidden Science. And 
that wasn't just a marketing thing. Uh, Greg Braden, who's part of this collaboration, insisted we call it that because you can't bring this science into the classroom at the present time because there are too many institutions that uh, that would be uh, that would feel they were being hurt by the truth coming out. Yeah, this, so it's unfortunate, about, but that's... Yeah. This is about to change, however, because um, this is formal, it's straight up math, it's straight up physics, and, um, you know, um, it's based, and it doesn't have any weirdness, you don't have to come up with, like, very, you know, crazy esoteric concept. All the concepts that are present in there are standard concepts that are in physics. They've just been arranged in the proper order. And, um, and, and, and basically, uh, so, so it's about to change. The world is ready for it. I think, you know, you mentioned the stressors that we went through in the last two years, you know, on, on our planet uh, has really opened people up to like, we gotta have, we have to find solutions. We have to change the way we're doing things. And then the institution are really opening up. And I think it's a, it's a perfect time for, for this uh, knowledge to emerge. Yeah, it is truly. I mean, we need to, everybody knows we need to pivot. Even in the mainstream, we know we've got to pivot. We're not, clearly, we're not on a course that uh, is survivable for future generations. And that's what this work is addressing. It's, 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 it's a roadmap. It's a user's guide, which is as Nassim's team describes it. To what the universe is, how it works, and then we can harness the whole uh, power of the universe where we take advantage of this research. Let's go take a quick look at uh, uh, at a. This is about a four-minute clip. Now, Sim, can you go a few minutes over, or do you have? Are you on a right at? Uh, sure. At, yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. We won't go too much over. So let's go to a clip. I want you to see a little more of this uh, program that we just developed with Nassim Harriman and Greg Braden. We're going to go to the clip right now. Since the beginning of time, ancient civilization and humanity has been wondering about the nature of reality. This series is going to be an exploration of those thoughts throughout the ages and the modern interpretation of these thoughts and the resolution of these understandings to modern physics. When we think about the nature of reality in terms of the ancient knowledge and philosophy, uh, we come to something very common in many cultures all around the world. And that is that there is a fundamental field of information, a fundamental field of energy, which can be described as information in modern physics, as there is a relationship between information and energy. This fundamental field of energy being the source of everything we see in our reality, including ourselves and the consciousness that animates it. This is something that is found in many different cultures around the world. Uh, it's called different names in these different cultures, but it has similar fundamental concepts. And uh, it's called mana in some civilizations. It's called prana or chi in others. This is a fundamental concept that eventually finds its way all the way to the time of Maxwell and the writing of electromagnetic equations. So it spends a very large amount of time and is described in many different ways at one point or another in history. That is, it's described in later history, for instance, as an ether, uh, some kind of prevailing um, fluid at the time, not described as a superfluid, but quantitatively described as a fluid. And is the properties of space itself. 
Now, the concept that space has something in it, that it's not empty, might sound unusual or alien to most of your experience because it seems like there's nothing in the space. We know there's air, that's one thing, but if you were in space, in the universe space, um, the space seems empty or there's very little amount of particles in it. Although even between galaxies, particles are only centimeters apart. So that's the density of the vacuum between galaxies, which is the highest vacuum we know of, uh, which is much higher than the vacuum uh, that we can create in a chamber on Earth. But there's more than particles in this field because you could ask, what is a particle in the first place? Which is what we're trying to understand here is the nature of reality. Okay, and that, uh, so this is, there's a sister program. So this uh, secretscientificdiscoveries.com is where you sign up for this 60-minute program with uh, Nassim that's uh, airing next Tuesday and that just aired last night with uh, Greg. You're going to get both of those. And then the sister program for those that want to go deeper and really come down into the fullness of the science and the implications, the applications for this science in our daily life is this forbidden science program. You'll learn about it through uh, Secret Scientific Discoveries, uh, this program that we're airing right now. That was a clip from uh, from that program, and that was shot right there in the Sims lab in uh, in Southern California. So, uh, boy, uh, I don't want to uh, keep us much longer. We we've, we've gone over. Uh, let me just share there, and there are tons of questions here. So, thank you, viewers. These are I think humanity's stream members. There's some people on your uh, websites that are commenting and coming in with questions too. The Sim Amy says, "How will our lives change? I'm I'm made of stardust." That is, if I'm understanding this correctly. And of course, Amy, I'm going to throw this question at Nassim. We've been trying to unfurl this here because, you know, I think our lives are going to change in very substantial ways. We're trying to give you little tastes of how, how our lives might change. But truly, it's like a tarp that we're unfurling. Uh, and, you know, we, we really are getting clarity now about the universe and how it works. There's, there's a, a roadmap. Uh, and... Uh, it's probably going gonna, gonna to take some time to really fully understand the implications of all of this, though there are many that are, uh, that are very clear right now. Nassim, are there uh, any other things you want to share them, as we're wrapping up our program? Sure. One of them um, has to do with um, how we think of health and how we think of biology and uh, where the information flow uh, for biological systems to produce energy and stay coherent. So getting old, for instance, is a result of a reduction in ATP production or these molecules that are done by the mitochondria. And the mitochondria makes a lot of ATP in a day. If you do nothing in a day, it will, it will uh, recycle or it will process almost uh, your body weight in ATP. That's remarkable. If you run a marathon that day, you will process approximately a ton of ATP that day. Um, and getting old is a reduction of the ATP uh, production in your body. And what happens is the cell starts uh, making errors when it duplicates and, uh, you know, your body starts falling apart. And, um, and basically, uh, from this understanding of the source of charge and the source of um, energy uh, coming from the plant field through the atomic structure into the biological structure, we have already a roadmap to how to uh, couple with the field at the biological level so it doesn't decohere as much, so that there's not so much entropy. And that would mean that cells could live for a really long time or almost ever, you know, meaning that you would maintain coherency. And, uh, you know, there people might say, oh, are you talking about, you know, immortality? And I'm, that might be the, I mean, even if we just got 
200 years instead of 100 years uh, would be nice. Uh, and, and, and immortality is not out of the question. We have examples of immortality on our planet. There's animals. If you look up on Google, immortal animals, there's animals on our planet that don't die. Um, cells, biological cells have been shown even in laboratory that they can live forever if they're given the right environment. So, uh, so this is, this is a possibility. Now imagine, I don't know about you guys, but I'm in my fifties and I know that I'm just actually starting to get the wisdom that I should have, you know, to, uh, to function in the world. I am just, I'm just starting to get like to getting it. Um, and, and, uh, so our lives are so short. So then imagine if we could, um, extend our life significantly. We've already done that in our evolution. We've gone from like life expectancies of 30 and 40 years old to like 80 years old uh, for most countries in the, in the world right now. But, but we could, if we extend that to like maybe 150 to 200 years old to 300 years old, imagine the wisdom of our society as we would have, you know, people that have this level of awareness and, and wisdom in our world, uh, you know, probably our political leaders would lead a little differently and so on. And so those are like just one thing I can think of, of like the impact of understanding this level of physics and the, this the way the universe function at the deeper level wow yeah astounding thank you so uh so run a marathon viewers <laughs> uh, or exercise you know so here's here's the science that talks about what exercise is doing you know in terms of lengthening our lives creating a higher quality of life uh etc so again the there, there's a lot here to unfurl join uh, nasem and i next tuesday this coming tuesday 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for this uh, secret scientific discoveries.com uh, program. It's about an hour long. Uh, you'll be glad you did. Now, Sam, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for being here live with us today from your laboratory, from pulling away from the research to be with us and, the, and your uh, resident science foundation. Thank you to all of your team for the incredibly important work you're doing. Viewers, check out this uh, Im important nonprofit organization there incredible uh also want to thank all the humanities team humanity stream uh nasim harriman uh, sign network all of you viewers that are out there that are tuning in to our program our live program every friday we're grateful uh let's pull the camera back i want to show you uh, i'm in a live studio here in boulder colorado you'll see jim gray who's here with me i'm over here there's jim okay so jim thanks for uh he uh, pulls this whole program together. Uh, thank you. And there's a large team actually in the humanities team. Uh, Nanette Kennedy, Dee Meyer, Karen Gordon, uh, Garth Catterall are, uh, are some of the people that are supporting this program. They're out on these uh, various sites right now pulling your comments and questions in. And lastly, viewers, hey, thank you. Again, thanks to all of you for being present here. We're on a conscious journey. Our mission as a global nonprofit organization is to make conscious living pervasive worldwide by 2040 in the next 20 years. And hey, let's do that for ourselves. Let's do it for our kids. Let's do it for this beautiful planet that we live on. Join with us. If you go to humanitiesteam.org, you can learn a lot more about our nonprofit organization. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, Nassim, uh, again, thank you so much for uh, being here with us. Wow, what an incredible hour it's been. Uh, gratitude. Thank you so much for having me and for having this platform. Uh, to propagate the information and uh, and and build community and uh, and thank you for uh, Greg Braden to uh, contribute to this with me. It's been so fun to work with us it, uh, with him. It um, it's our thirty year contrib uh, you know collaboration uh, anniversary uh, this year, and we're we were excited to like do something together like this and. So thank you for making it that happen. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's the first masterclass that Nassim Harriman and Greg Braden have done together. They've known each other for 30 years. They actually talk about that in this program. Uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, and we were so gratitude to...
both of you that you were able to make the time. You're incredibly busy, both of you, uh, doing stuff, research, flying all over the world, speaking. They made the time to create these uh, master classes. And uh, wow, we're, we're grateful because our whole thing is just extending our reach and impact to the whole world. Uh, this, this program, by the way, Forbidden Science is in Spanish also. We're in the process of taking the streaming platform and having it stream in every language so it can go into every home, in every language, in every faith tradition, in every region of the world so that we can, when we talk about making conscious living pervasive worldwide, uh, things like forbidden science, you know, we can bring that right into every single home on the planet. I mean, how cool and how important is that? So, uh, so join with us in this. And uh, also, as we know, our lives are so much more prosperous and fruitful when we live consciously as opposed to just this material mindset of more, more, more that, uh, it, that never is satisfied, right? That's why we're on a conscious journey because it's so much more fruitful. So uh, again, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you, Nassim Harriman, and uh, look forward to being with you again here, brother. Thank you. Peace and blessings. Thank you so much. <laughs>